Okay, so good morning and welcome to the final event in the 2023 Whatcom Read series. My name is Claire and I work at Village Books and Paper Dreams in Fairhaven and Linden, Washington, and we're so glad that you could join us today. Um, we are going to begin with a land acknowledgement made more poignant by some of the depictions of the treatment of Native Americans in this year's Whatcom Reads title, The Cold Millions. We are on the ancestral homeland of the Nooksack and Lummi people. They have been its stewards since time immemorial, respecting the land, river, and ocean with the understanding that everything is connected, related, and alive. We acknowledge the elders and their collective and individual plights and achievements. We consider the legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together today. And we pursue ongoing action to build lasting relationships and grow together so that all may prosper. Thank you. So this year marks the 15th anniversary of Whatcom Reads, our community-wide reading program. Whatcom Reads started with a grant from the Library Services and Technology Act written by Linda Lambert, who was director of the Whatcom Community College Library at the time, and Joan Aroldi, who was the director of Whatcom County Library System. They shared a passion for books and reading and brought together partners from all of the public and academic libraries in Whatcom County. This year, the first year, Whatcom Reads presented Sherman Alexi and his National Book Award winning novel, An Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. Since then, we've read and discussed mysteries, historical fiction, memoirs, and literary fiction. We've traveled to the Alaskan interior, to the Berlin Olympics, the length of the Pacific Crest Trail, and to a Bar Barbados sugar plantation. We've explored themes of perseverance, honesty, curiosity, friendship, and environmentalism, among many others. I'd like to thank Linda Lambert for her role in establishing Whatcom Reads as an annual literary event 15 years ago, and we dedicate this year's season to Joan Aroldi, who passed away last December. Since the beginning, Whatcom Reads has been a team effort with representatives from the Bellingham Public Library, the Bellingham Technical College, Northwest Indian College, Western Washington University, Whatcom Community College, Whatcom County Library System, and our community partner, Village Books. We would like to thank Allied Arts of Whatcom County for coordinating the Whatcom Reads Art Challenge, Whatcom Museum for program support, and the Hotel Leo for providing lodging for our author. We're also grateful to the writers who submitted their work for the Whatcom Writes Anthology um, entitled Between Fact and Fiction, which in includes an introduction by Jess Walter. Major funding for Whatcom Reads comes from the Friends of the Bellingham Public Library and the Whatcom County Library Foundation. And if you bought a copy of The Cold Millions from Village Books, please know that a percentage of the proceeds will go towards supporting next year's program. If you buy a copy of the Whatcom Rights Anthology, 100% of the proceeds after printing costs goes to Whatcom Reads. All titles are available at Village Books and on our website. Thank you for joining us online today. So I want to draw attention to the online evaluation forms. I will place a chat, a, a link in the chat to those evaluation forms. Please be sure, be sure to fill out a very brief form at the end of this um, event because the information that you provide about our program is, programming is tremendously helpful to us. So we'll be keeping the chat open for the duration of the event and we encourage you to use this feature. However, I do want to state that this virtual readings gallery is a safe space. Any user exhibiting offensive or inappropriate behavior will be dismissed from the event immediately. There will be a Q&A towards the end of the event, so I encourage you to utilize the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You may place questions there as you think of them throughout the duration of the event, and we'll get to as many as we can in the time that we have this morning. Okay, so now I want to introduce our moderator for this morning's conversation. Paul Hansen is one of three owners of Village Books and Paper Dreams, and before coming to Bellingham in 2011, he was the longtime manager of Eagle Harbor Book Company on Bainbridge Island. He's a writer and a publisher and former president of the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association. He's also the programmer for the Chuck and Nut Writers Workshops and Classes, and since 2012 has also served as one of the Chuck and Nut Writers Conference coordinators, which have been on hiatus. Stay tuned. Okay, welcome, Paul. And of course, Jess Walter, just maybe the most popular and versatile Washington State author writing today. He started out as a reporter in Spokane for the Spokesman Review, and he brings a journalist's eye for detail, an appreciation for the everyman, a sly sense of humor, and a warmth for his characters, flawed as they may be. 
In The Cold Millions, Jess Walter takes us back through Washington State's history and gives us a glimpse of a time when mining and timber magnates were building glittering cities in Spokane and Seattle, while the laborers doing the work were treated with disdain. He follows the story of two brothers, Ryan Gig, as they try to eke out a living, find love, and build a future in a world ready to chew them up and spit them out. The Washington Post calls it a work of irresistible characters, harrowing adventures, and rip-roaring fun. It's no wonder that The Cold Million stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for over a year and was named Best Book of the Year by numerous publications. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Jess Walter and Paul Hansen. I'm imagining all of the applause here. It's, <laughs> you know, during the, the years of uh, uh, COVID, we had uh, so many virtual events that we couldn't see anybody. And so we were navigating those waters. And that was probably the, one of the most disconcerting things was not having that live interaction with the audience. Um, and this would be the point where I would usually say, have a show of hands, how many were attending the other uh, Walk and Reads events. So we can only speculate that I think our audience is probably made up of the completionists who want to see every single moment <laughs> of Jess Walter for this for these events, uh, or people who couldn't make it for whatever reason, and um, maybe they're virtual in other places, or just people who don't like to wear pants. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think uh, for authors that that was the same experience. It was, it was both uh, amazing that I could be in London and, uh, you know, and suddenly in Birmingham, Alabama, the same day. But, uh, but I missed being in, you know, out at bookstores and with people. It's been it's really great to get to get back to Bellingham and, you know, and be in the same room with all those great readers. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're so glad you visited. And we're also glad that we're able to do a, an amalgam of these things yeah, and preserve yeah. this opportunity for people to be able to still yeah. attend when they could. Yeah. So thank you for being here. Uh, speaking of the, uh, well, actually, first off, how did you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I got a little bit of sleep. Yeah, yeah finally, I caught good. up. Yeah, yeah. Good. So did you get but, earplugs for the the trains? Yeah, no the the, the trains are part of my uh, my internal monologue now, so that was no problem. It was <laughs> it was lovely to hear the trains of Bellingham right. uh, on their way uh, east, on their way south and north. Right, right. Yeah, uh, Ke Kelly and I were uh, we got married on the Village Green, and we had our wedding night in Seattle, and or uh, there in Bellingham, and that was the first time we'd experienced those trains. So yeah, I, I felt yeah. your pain because it wasn't a yeah. familiar thing. Yeah. Um. Uh, speaking of which, you had kind of a grand the last couple of days or few days. You've had a grand tour of Bellingham and Wacom. I know it was kind of a guided tour in a lot of ways. You don't have a lot of time on your hands. Um. I was thinking of doing just uh, for the folks who were there at some of the events and all so the folks who couldn't make it, I was thinking of having just a little recap a little bit and your impressions of some of the things. So you yeah. arrived on a Wednesday for the Evolve Life Between the Pages dinner. I caught the last bit of Life Between the Pages, got to see a little bit of bathtub gin and um, bourbon served in, in brown paper bags and some incredible food with Northwest ingredients. You know, I, I think if I was a chef and someone told me you'll be making a meal based on a novel set uh, in the world of vagrants, I would think, you know, um, and I, uh, but there was no squirrel meat. Uh, it was um, some really great sort of campfire ideas. And it's, it's as with the Allied Arts show, it's so great to see what other artists bring to an idea and watching uh, that great chef and mixologist come up with terrific uh, food and drinks uh, based on the novel was wonderful. And then, um, you know, getting to go to the Deming Library and uh, watching readers go into small groups and talk about the novel. One of the great developments since I started publishing is the proliferation of book clubs. And to see a library sort of form these impromptu little book clubs was really cool to see. Uh, and I had, I had to, uh, I had two interrogators there, good cop and bad cop. And so that was, uh, <laughs> uh, that was nice to see. And then, um, you know, and then of course the Chuck and Nut, uh, radio hour, which was so much fun to watch. Um, all, all of you guys have such great fun. And then to hear those great old labor songs performed by is Linda Allen, I believe. Um, yeah. 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 And, uh, and that was, you know, that was 
really marvelous too. And then, you know, to end it in that big, beautiful theater with, um, you know, with uh, all those people, it was, it was really great. And it was great to get back to Bellingham. My older daughter had gone to school there. And I remembered the downtown as being like a used record store and a lot of uh, more empty storefronts, you know, and so just to see how I love when, when, you know, uh, turn of the century downtowns revitalized in that way and I had just some terrific meals too so it was good, it was really good. great yeah, to get back been to coming back to now. life which has been great yeah and to see all those and as I said I mean the highlight for me is just meeting all those readers that you know teaching a craft class at village books with um, with such great questions from people you know I I don't think I got the same question twice um and i had a question i'd never had last night at the at mount baker theater when the very first question was when someone stepped to, up to the microphone and said is this on and i thought that was a brilliant question that i had never <laughs> gotten before so <laughs> that's great oh you had asked a question which i never did answer uh when the chuck and radio hour is going to be uh aired yes and, yeah. um the there's the local radio station at 102.3 fm but also we have a podcast so oh, great. we'll be yeah. posting that in a few weeks and i'll send you the link when that happens yeah and so, the, for the people who miss it you should really track it down it was really great to hear all that music and uh comedy and poetry uh, it was really fun yeah yeah a little comedy a little comedy <laughs> yes yeah. <laughs> a lot of music a little comedy yeah. <laughs> well the uh speaking of the craft talk i was uh that was really um inspiring and actually i did go home and write after that oh, did and, you um, oh, yes it was um yeah. i there were a lot of really great takeaways and i was writing that's furiously great. so thank you for that one of the things that reminded me of you spent a lot of time talking about opening lines and for the benefit of the folks who weren't here um and i was remembering the um barbara king solvers quote and uh, what she has said is uh, the first sentence of a book is a promise to a reader. Oh, wow. And um, yeah. that reminded me a lot of the, the ones that you were talking about, the importance of the, the opening yeah. line. And how I think it's and, and what I try to tell the writers is it's a promise to the writer, too. Mm -hmm. It um, You have to remind yourself, you know, what you, what it is you set out to do. And as the book evolves, sometimes that that first chapter and first section and first sentence changes, too, um, because you're you're. Um, intent begins to change with the book so always returning to that beginning to me is a great way to remind yourself what you're setting out to do mm -hmm. I've, uh, and one of the things I try to do uh, after, since hearing her say that is I go back and I reread the first line knowing the importance to it yeah. and yeah. how it the, the change of it uh, yeah. uh, after reading through the whole book how it changes yeah. the meaning and I think the thing that I maybe forgot to mention in the class was how important that is for the next step, which is publishing. If you can get an agent's attention, a publisher's attention, they want you to succeed if that beginning is so powerful that, um, you know, you if you can get them on board early, that's really a great, you know, step toward publishing. Mm -hmm. Well, the, there's a, this, this, you are exemplary at your first lines and this oh, one's thanks. no exception. And uh, I was talking to somebody who has, uh, uh, last night who had read all of your books and she was picking up each one and saying oh you got to read the first line of this one oh <laughs> it, it'll be hooked yeah. and so yeah hopefully <laughs> that's not all you have to read the, no uh, no <laughs> yeah. but yeah. she knew that reading is you yeah. want to take off and read the rest of them that's um good. there's been a lot of uh you have so many amazing characters in your books right. and um the from the deliciously villainous yet complex um uh, characters in there one that i i was I, I don't know if i missed anybody asking about it but i was curious about the character of the novel war and peace oh uh-huh yeah i, which I is felt like that was character. another character through the yeah. through the whole it was a good thread through there and if you'd like to talk about that yeah you know they're really it, for me that book worked on a couple of different levels one um, it is when I think of novels that are about the way history sort of rolls over normal people, um, I think of Tolstoy sort of, um, you know, writing that novel in a way in which the Napoleonic War all of a sudden changes the lives of all of these characters. And, uh, and that, to me, is a, a little bit of... Uh, of a parallel with what I hope to write here. And so the this novel, for those of you who are structuralists, um, has the same number of sections, has an, a prologue and an epilogue, just like War and Peace. Um, it, 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 I, I consider myself sort of echoing the structure as I wrote. Um, 
Uh, and then, of course, but then it works textually to the uh, for Gig, it's really an aspirational book. You know, he is uh, he's uh, uh, a hobo who's read two fifths of it and pronounces it the greatest work of literature uh, known to man. And that that aspiring to read is something that really struck me. The the fact that that these men would um, pack a small bag, a small bindle with everything they owned, and they would use some of that space for a book. And then they would trade those books over a campfire with someone else. Here's a Rousseau. I'll trade you for this Tolstoy. Here is, um, you know, a Nietzsche. And that, and the idea that they built what they called a great hobo library by passing books around struck me as one of the most profound things about my research. And so making Gig that sort of person for whom books are the way he aspires to make himself a better person made um, War and Peace, uh, you know, a kind of a, uh, an aspirational book, but also something that connected the brothers. And so when Rye read it later, you know, when even in the epilogue, when his daughter said, but dad, Anna Karenina is such a better novel. You know, I loved that dialogue back and forth between them and the way that book came to represent making a better version of yourself, rising up. Um, and, and I think it's one of the reasons that libraries are so prominent in the novel, too, is that's the place where we have access to those books, the most egalitarian place that I know, certainly in the world. Yeah, yeah. Thank goodness for the libraries. Yes, yeah. yeah. And the bookstores, yeah. <laughs> the... Um... Uh, one of the craft aspects that uh, I think was uh, struck me personally as a writer, I, I had written a short story one time and I uh, workshopped it to my class and mm -hmm. no one read it. And it was a short story that ended in the, it was told from the point of view of a character and it ended in his death. Oh, wow. And yeah. somebody so you invented that. I was wondering who did that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and somebody gave me the the rule. They said, no, you never do that. You never write something first person that it ends in their death. And I just felt like there was, was this pronouncement that yeah. I, this unwritten thing or unknown thing that authors never do that. And then to see it's happened so many times in your author, I felt very vindicated. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. But, well, someone should tell Ambrose Bierce. I think uh, an occurrence <laughs> at Owl Creek Bridge has that same structure. So, yeah. 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 Uh, the And I know the short story you had in Harper's, about the fairy uh, mm -hmm. ends in the point of view character's death. Is that, yeah. uh, did that kind of inspire you to do that in throughout the novel in so many of the characters? It really did. It, um, I found it, I found it incredibly intimate to be there at the last moment of a character's life. And, um, and, and I had read it in, in other things, you know, there, there, there's a book called Severances, which is about actual um, decapitations uh, imagined by, I can't remember the author's name, but, um, and, I, and I found it so amazing in that way. And then, you know, an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge too. And, and other books too are, you know, oh, Alice Siebel, The Lovely Bones is narrated from beyond the grave. You know, it happens in ways that I think are often sort of ghostly. But for me, I wanted to just take those lives up until the very last minute. And, and really it was writing that short story, which uh, was originally called Plants Fairy, which becomes the kid in the novel. And, um, and that and, and then there was a moment in my research, which I think I described standing in front of police chief John Sullivan's house and having and looking in his window and thinking, um, I'm writing about this, this past in a way and connecting with many real characters. And I did feel a sort of responsibility to inhabit their thoughts and to think that the that they that these some of these people actually once walked the very streets that I walked filled me with um, I think a deeper appreciation, a, diff a, a different sort of view of characters than maybe I'd had before. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it, those sections were very fun to write um, at, from a writer's standpoint, but they also felt deeper in a character way than I think they had before. So um, it, it, it felt like such challenge to me, you know, to try to write like that. And then, and then I ended up thinking that it really added to the novel. Oh yes, um, definitely. Yeah. I, I, but I think you should go back to that story. I think. Uh, yeah, I think actually, you, in retrospect, I'm thinking maybe I just, I just didn't do it as well as you do. <laughs> yeah, or, or it just wasn't long enough. Maybe it wanted to be a novel. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
the uh so speaking of the villainous characters um the i was thinking of uh, early reston and who he starts out as just you know a, a friendly guy along with the rest of them yeah. and uh slowly transforms into um the the villain that he is and the uh but his speech on the train or when he was talking to rye about uh, that ends up with time to blow up the whole castle um there was a i, I know it having a complex character where they they feel even if they're a villain they feel like they're doing the right thing uh, but yeah. there was a, a i don't know a, a, a truth to it where yeah peasant that, after peasant rising it, up. it's so funny you mentioned that because i um early reston is an interesting character i was really inspired by the real historical figure of harry orchard who was arrested and charged for the murder of frank stunenberg the idaho governor in 1905 an anarchist who sometimes worked for the for the um, Pinkertons, who um, who seemed to show up sort of uh, Forrest Gump like at all of these flashpoints of of battles between um, police and um, unions and and you never quite knew what his motivation was. Was he an anarchist who um, pretended to be a Pinkerton or was he a Pinkerton who pretended to be an anarchist? And I loved the idea of having a character whose motives are so shadowy and ambiguous that even the omniscient author may not entirely know. Um, and I loved playing with that idea. A lot of times I'm experimenting to see what it will look like to do something I haven't done before. But I, I realized in that moment that when when he gives that speech, I wanted it to be something that was um, as swaying as Elizabeth Gurley Flynn speech mm -hmm. and him saying, you know, yeah, the these capitalists want money. You've joined a union. Why? What do you want? You want money. You want a dollar. It's a dollar. It's a hundred dollars. It's a million dollars. It's the same thing. Um, right. You want the same thing. And then taking that further and saying, you know, what you're talking about is just changing who owns the castle. Maybe we need to blow up the castle. And taking it to that anarchist idea that um, that the whole system needs to be exploded, you know, and um, you know, and and through something, you know, uh, that pathway through there through even talking about Shakespeare and saying it doesn't matter this king kills that king and then there's another king. All we're doing, you know, if you if you're going to make labor the king, you're going to end up in the same position. I think it's important as a novelist to not be didactic and to be able to create to write a viewpoint that you may not agree with, but again to imbue those characters with the depth and and give them the power of their own motivation that they think they're doing the right thing even even lem brand who i have so little sympathy for tells rye i want you to have this i want you to have this great wealth that i have you know he's one of those people who believes in the power of the individual and and believes that he has pulled himself up by the bootstraps and claims to want to give rye the same thing um and giving those characters a voice like that deepens them. I don't think it 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 takes away from their villainy. It, you still get to write these incredibly, um, you know, these characters who do things that push the the novel in a you know in that direction. But it it explains those characters in a way that I think make them as real, hopefully, as as the more heroic characters. Yeah, yeah. Well, not hopefully you succeeded in that. No, if they're just a black yeah. cape uh, villain, then and uh, they're so it. fun to write. I mean, I, <laughs> I was having so much fun writing Del Delvo, and because much of the novel is a love letter to Spokane, to have someone whose very first you know thought of Spokane is that it's um, you know that a box of misery spilled over the valley, and that uh, <laughs> uh, and 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 I loved that he says the whole town gives me the morbs, and that and that, that was <laughs> one of those the the morbs was one of those those 19th century phrases that I thought why did we lose this you know yeah. anyone anyone who's who has lived politically through the last you know um through maybe the 2016 election knows exactly what the morbs is this feeling of unease and of darkness that settles over you and uh and to write a character like Dell who uh personifies the morbs who is the morbs showing up in your town was great fun I think it's time to bring that back yeah. morbs yeah morbid <laughs> feeling of unease i mean yeah, yeah. how many yeah. times do we how many times do we get the morbs it's kind of the weather is sort of morbs weather today yeah i i'm my mind is reeling with the number of applications for that word yes right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh the switching gears just a little bit another scene that 
uh, was there, there are so many to choose from, and I know everybody's got their favorite ones and their favorite characters, but uh, I'm trying to bring up ones that maybe you haven't talked about already, so you don't feel like, oh, I've already uh, retread that ground. <laughs> um, the reunion of Ursula and Gig after he gets out of oh, prison. Man, that was such yeah. a, the, the whole thing, not just the, the scene with the, you know, the biblical-esque scene where she, yeah. with the washing, but er, the way that she handles him and brings him back to life, it was just... Yeah. It was so it, beautiful, and you, it's, it, it was off stage for so long, and to bring yeah. it back. There's that old saw about you know characters acting on their own, which doesn't happen. You know, I I, I think that throws me as a young writer because I would create characters and then wait for them to do something, you know, yeah. and they don't. You have to put them in action. <laughs> but to bring back two characters late in the novel that you've gotten to know so well. Um, it is this wild experience of thinking like, well, now that I know them, I know how they would act. And, and, and gig at that point is really defeated and beaten by being in jail and he, and by his own weaknesses and this strong, vibrant head turning young man feels really defeated. And, um, you know, I, I, sort of usually shy away from writing scenes of intimacy and sex like that. And I wanted to give, I mean, they had a hot relationship. I wanted it to be a little sultry and smoky. And so when she washes him and cleans him and shaves him and says, there he is. And then, you know, when he becomes, starts to become aroused and she says, there he is, mm -hmm. you know, it was so much fun to write that, um, you know, that really sensual, um, almost modern woman in Ursula, um, you know, re recovering the, the lover that she had lost briefly and, and, uh, and what that gives back to gig that little moment of humanity that brings him back, I think, from his from his time in jail it was it was pretty fun to write I, I don't know if I'll, um, I'll find myself like uh, writing erotic fiction from now on. But, you know, instead of, you know, sort of the 1950s, just sort of close the frame as the couple gets together. It was really fun to imagine that scene through. And then and the intimacy of those two characters who I feel like I'd gotten to know in this way was, you know, it was really rewarding for a writer. And I and I usually figure if I'm moved that I, I imagine the writer, the reader might be as well. Yeah, yeah, it was very moving. And I, I I I understand not wanting to do that or wanting to shy away from that piece, but the uh, and, and having it's, knowing the characters so well, right. it's, the, it's about the characters. It's and it's not and it's never because I'm a prude at all. I love yeah. reading that kind of writing. It's just hard to do. It's hard, you know. The language either goes to you know clinical or to you know right. overly sentimental, and um, and so sometimes you know uh, I I once heard um, I once heard. Uh, uh, Salman Rushdie read this amazing sex scene that went on for pages and pages in which he took out all the physical description. And so it was all just guttural noises. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and it was so funny. And it just, it made you realize the sort of difficulty in writing those scenes, you know, right, because right. they can so easily sort of parody themselves if you're not careful. There was a craft class I took uh, bef uh, before, and it was um, the writing sex scenes as a an erotica i should say instead of mm -hmm. sex scenes uh, writing erotica as a doorway to write writing the difficult parts of your life yeah, and if you can yeah. um it, get past that hurdle then maybe there's yeah. a, a other truths and other parts yeah. of your writing that will that will make easier garth greenwell teaches a really great class on this also and um and you know and uh i think you know as a as a gay writer i think it's he you know to i think for him it 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 has a you know special importance because the themes he's often writing about are tied very much to the sexual nature of the characters um and so again it i think it had it often had more to do with my own insecurities as a writer you know but i also writing sort of comic um novels uh you know, usually that's sort of where those scenes end up is, you know, kind of if you're if if you love puncturing the vanities of your characters, then that's a then when they come together, um, you know, to have sex, then the vanities uh, are pretty easy to puncture usually. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, to uh, I'm going to shift sure. gears just a little bit more again, but also refer back to when uh, you were talking about at the uh, uh, last night at Mount Baker Theater. And the uh, how this novel was, um, you felt like an, an homage to your father in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, I 
one of my other favorite scenes is uh, where Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is facing down the guys in Taft. Yeah. Yeah. And she says, whether you want me to or not, I'm, I'm here to fight for you. And yeah. that reminded me of your story with the, uh, your father in the belt buckle. Yeah, yeah, my dad's funeral. Uh, um, yeah. One of the old union members coming up saying, you know, I didn't vote for your dad and after he was laid off. You know, um, he he was laid off before they got the 50th, 50th year anniversary of Kaiser aluminum silver belt buckles. And my dad saw him in a bar and went up and said, you know, I, I know you got laid off before we got these. I wanted you to have it and took off his belt buckle and gave it to this man. And the man brought it to my dad's funeral and said, you know, even if I didn't vote for your dad, he had my best interest at heart. And I couldn't think of a more um, profound and true expression of what it meant to my dad to be a union worker, to bring everyone up, whether they agreed with you or not, and and then being raised with that. Um, that's that was what I took from my dad. You know, this that sense of equality and fairness, fairness almost more than all. And so when I was, you know, when I was writing the novel, I was thinking very much about. That's one of the reasons I chose this, what I think of as the origin story of American labor in a way, this period when it's not about, you know, can we get a fourth week of vacation? It is, can we have decent, you know, working, um, uh, can we have decent hours and, you know, and pay that you can live on and, and not treat you know, these men like cogs in a wheel and women right. like cogs in a wheel. And that, and so that, that really did inform the novel. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think my dad would have really liked this one. I do. Yeah. Well, I, I felt like she was coming or he was coming through in Elizabeth. Yeah. Carlin, like, thank you. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that scene in Taft, man, I mean, it, I didn't invent too many things with Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, but knowing she traveled all around the West to Wallace and to these mining camps and, and she had been to some really rough camps. She describes them in her autobiography. She never mentions Taft, but me knowing that this was, you know, described as the worst cesspool in America at the time and the roughest place and that the, in the spring, they would find, you know, 13 or 14 people killed in bar fights, you know, defrosting in the snow, you know, knowing that it was that sort of tough place. Um, I wanted to send her to that place. And as a writer, you know, I've talked a little bit about the writing challenges you give yourself. And I can't tell you how many times I start with, can I write a scene that is has every bit the power and drama of a gunfight, but is about someone talking their way out of violence? Yeah. You know? Oh, and, nice. <laughs> and that, and, you know, because we all were watching Deadwood, we can't wait till the guns come out. Well, what if we have a scene that has all that drama, but is about this, you know, person who um, her her power is her ability to speak to people and to talk to a room full of men who want to commit, kill and rob and do horrible things um, and talking and convincing them that um, do that if you want, but um, but I'm here to fight for you. Uh, you know, it was uh, it was I couldn't think of a better way to express the self sacrifice of those kinds of early union activists than um, than in that speech. Yeah, it was so powerful on the page, and I yeah, uh, yeah. also listened to it uh, performed with yeah. the audio book. And boy, she does a good job with yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> she does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, gr growing up, I wasn't. Uh, you know, you can't avoid fights when you're growing up. There's always uh, somebody who wants to uh, pick on you or yeah. uh, pick a fight with you. I was never much of a fighter, but boy, I talked my way out of more than a few Did fights. You? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I used to say that my. Um, my record as a fighter was 0, 4 and 1. Um, but my brother, who was at the one draw, kind of shrugs like, I don't know. I think uh, <laughs> I think I think that draw is uh, was also a loss. So yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. I, I was thankful my kids didn't grow up at the bus stop fighting age that I was uh, that I was in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I uh, I. I uh, want to make sure we've got time for some yeah. uh, Q&A from the folks. Claire, do you want to uh, uh, open up the chat room or the Q&A and see how we're doing with that? Sorry, I should give you more notice. That's okay. <laughs> I, I, had, I had taken off my headphones and was... Uh... I need to get them back on. So yes, yeah. absolutely. So this has been, um, since you just kind of were talking about Taft, there's one sort yeah. of fun little nugget I want to say that I notice. Um, as I was reading about Taft, 
-hmm. I was like, why is this familiar to me? Why do I already know that Taft was kind of a really despicable place? And then I remembered um, in a previous Whatcom Reads when we had, when we did the big burn with Tim, Tim Egan. Egan. Yeah. And I remembered reading yeah. about Taft and, and the, um, the community's yeah. response to this fire that's coming and, you know, people, you know, we need to, we need to take action. We need to, do, and they're all just like, nope, we're just going to get drunk. And... They, 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 <laughs> they, they emptied every keg in the town, climbed yeah. on a train as embers were raising down or raining right. down. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was just the, so funny. And then the whole log camp burned to the ground, the whole yeah. camp burned to the ground yeah right yeah. it was yeah. just horrible but it was funny reading yeah the scene yeah, with elizabeth Gurley, Gurley yeah. flynn and just going why do i already and of course this and of course tim, Taft? tim egan is another spokane boy and um we know each other we've known each other for years and yeah. uh and so it was yeah it was so great to read that and then and right before the novel came out they discovered the boot hill the, the graveyard and um um <sighs> Another old reporter that I used to work with, this incredible reporter named Bill Moreland, had a piece in the New York Times about them discovering Boot Hill. And I wrote him a note and said, I'm writing novels and you're still scooping me with your stories, you know, because uh, I thought, I, I thought uh, Egan and I had tapped to ourselves, but um, he was still writing about it. Well, that's funny. Well, I, I thought that that was a really great, yeah. um, great yeah. uh, connection of, of yeah. The and the, and of the Big Burn is such a terrific book, like all of Tim's. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was so yeah. so pleased that he that uh, the readers there got to experience Tim also. Yeah. Well, we do have um, some audience questions. Sure. Um, so the first one has to do with the uh, um, hobo. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Scott says, "Always thought hobo." was a term coined during the Great Depression and Dust Bowl of men leaving families. Um, but you found the word earlier in the 1900s. So it's yeah, not actually really a question, but if you could speak to that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, originally it meant hoe boy. It was a boy who carried a hoe over his shoulder. And that's how you showed the symbol that that's how you showed that you were working. If you were a hoe boy, you had um, a, a guard, uh, uh, you know, an agricultural implement you brought with you. And um, and it, yeah, it totally predates that. In fact, the the Wobblies had that great um, differentiation between uh, a hobo travels and works, a tramp travels and dreams, a bum travels and drinks. Um, and so even amongst the vagrant class, there was a sort of you know distinction. I'm I'm here to work. And so a hobo was not considered um you know, someone who was, you know, who was coming in just to lay about, it was someone who really wanted to make a living and was, you know, and, and was, and so I guess by definition, both of my grandfathers, you know, because they traveled by rail looking for uh, that kind of work and it, and it, it did certainly carry on through the depression. And then even now, you know, there's still a lot of people who sort of define themselves as hobos. That's, I, I, I love that. Um, at the at the dinner that that mm -hmm. you attended at Evolve Cafe the other night, that was one of the questions that Christine Perkins yeah. Um, yeah. posed to the entire room. Was so think about it. You know, which one are you? And maybe the audience can think about yeah. this too. Which one are you? Are you are you a bum? Yeah. <laughs> are you a tramp or are you a hobo? Um, I, so. I I realized that in the morning I'm a hobo. By <laughs> noon I'm a tramp and. Uh, if I can get a good Manhattan or old fashioned, I'm not above bumming it by about 7 p.m. So, yeah. All, all nice. of the above. Yeah. Nice. That. Very good. Paul, are you are you a bump a tramp? Bum a tramp? You know, actually, I'm uh, I'm going to borrow that, Jess. <laughs> all yours. <laughs> all yours. Yeah. Just a, a, a bit of yeah, yeah, it depends on the time of day. Don't let okay. yourself be pigeonholed. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Jolaine says, uh, did you intend, oh, this is a good one because I, I wondered this too. Did you intend for the reader to believe that early Reston died in the crash um, into the river or that he survived? Or did you want the reader to form their own opinion on that? She says, I think he survived it. Mm -hmm. um, tying back to what Jules said, one man to a boat, we all go over mm -hmm. alone. Yeah, I love that uh, reading. Um, one thing that I've I've learned to do is not not to treat ambiguity like a um you know like chopping us 
story at the end and all of a sudden you don't know what happened but i love those kind of open-ended things where a reader might have a slightly different read of things i think my first experience with it with how pleasing that could be was my novel citizen vince and um vince camden is a guy in the witness protection program a lifetime criminal who's gotten his voting rights restored and has to decide whether to vote for jimmy carter ronald reagan or john anderson in the 1980 presidential election and what i loved about um, and at the end, when he goes to vote, I almost imagine the camera rising up. So we see him, you remember back when he used to punch the thing, um, punching the thing, but not knowing which one he voted for. And I would get letters from all over. Who did he vote for? Um, because that, that's not really the center of the plot. He's being chased by these other guys. He's, you know, uh, the cops are after him. That's the real plot. But this side thing was what people really wanted to know. And I loved them making their own case for it, that I think this is what happened. I think that's what happened. I also have an idea, but I, as a as someone who is, re is writing the same book the reader is reading, I love that we can have different interpretations. I love yeah. that interpretation. I wanted Rye to, to fully think clearly, there's no way he could have survived that, but could he have survived that? And it was my, um, it was an effort to make early seem almost larger than life, almost like a force of nature who this sort of anarchic, um, you know, terrible, uh, impulse to destroy rather than rebuild goes on living. Um, early Reston was uh, probably at January 6th. You know, he was probably storming the Capitol. That that idea that, um, that, that you can kill early Reston, but you can never quite kill early Reston, you know, whatever that, that sort of darkness is. And so, um, uh, I, I'm sort of in, I, I sort of thought, well, there's no way he could have survived the crash, you know, as, as a totally rational being. And then I wanted to think, but is there, um, yeah. you know, the, the death of John Sullivan was never solved, um, you know, except for the possibility that there was this, uh, as you read in the epilogue, there was this character in Alabama, this man who's, this really happened, this wife beat her husband to death and then told police that he said he killed a cop somewhere in the West, Spokane or Seattle. Um, there were at least six unsolved murders that that could have been, including um, Arthur Waterbury, who begins the novel. Uh, and so, you know, we don't know that that was Sullivan. And so imagining that that could have been early Reston was what I wanted to plant in the reader's mind for that a very, re um, that very sort of reading. And I love connecting it to, to we all go over alone. Um, that was, you know, that is the the motif for death that occurs in the novel. And, um, you know, there's no other character that dies in tandem. So that's a really great reading. Yeah. Um, my book group, um, we spent quite a bit discussing oh, that, yeah. that That's very so question great. Yeah. and we had, we had all kinds of, right. um, differing theories. It's um, funny. Some people, sometimes people get really upset. They'll be like, no, who did he vote for? Who did Vince vote for? <laughs> and I'll say, you do understand it's a fictional character. And in, in, the, in the novel, um, another mafia member is going to kill him if he doesn't say. He's like, you have to tell me or I'm going to kill you. And he says, fine, I voted for Reagan. You did? No, I voted for Carter. Which one? He said, I voted for Anderson. <laughs> and as the author, I feel like I could do the same thing on into infinity. You know, No, he's dead. No, he's alive. Maybe he's alive. Yeah. Maybe he's dead. And, <laughs> and, uh, and to me, it just underlines the fact that, that this is an act of creativity that I'm sharing with the reader. We can have have a different interpretation of what the theme is of who the real villain is and we can even have a different interpretation of how um, something like that might end and if the to me if the if the resolution of the novel is satisfying enough if you know what happened to most of the characters leaving a few strands like that um, only enriches that experience thank you for doing that and for leaving space for the reader yeah that's, thank you yeah that's, yeah. that's a gift Thanks. Yeah, I was, I, but don't leave yeah. too much space, or the readers will come beat you to death. I <laughs> yeah, I I did. I fully loved the character of Early Reston. Thanks, Just I did too. Completely I completely intrigued. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and I and like Paul, I loved when he got to deliver a speech that was like that. Actually, makes sense, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. 
Um, so uh, Paul did ask you about, so Linda Lambert um, has a mm -hmm. question about um, about war and the war and peace mm -hmm. component. And I know that earlier, you know, right, right at the beginning, Paul did talk to you about how war and peace is a, is yeah. a character in it, uh, of its own, but um, and, I do and want this to this is Linda Lambert, one of the founding members yes, of Warner. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who couldn't yes, make so, it, she was out of town. So I know, I'm but I, I, I think I owe her some royalty payments or something. <laughs> but, uh, well, well, maybe, maybe she'll be happy with, if you'll just uh, answer her answer question, question right here. I'm sure, I'm deal. sure she will. Um, yeah. um, she says, I'd like to know how war and peace impacted you as a reader and yeah. when in the process of writing the cold millions you felt moved to include it you know i i tried to read war and peace when i was younger and then i saw a play just off broadway called natasha pierre and the great comet which takes this central piece of war and peace out and um and there's this incredibly moving scene that also happens in the novel when um when Prince Andre is dying on the battlefield and he lies there in the mud staring at the sky when a great comet goes by and he thinks what was this all about um what was all this honor what was these what were the movements of these armies and also why did I care so much what you know these people thought or it's it's a really profound moment and I went back to the novel um reading it in a totally different way not like an assignment but um it invested in these characters in such a way and and that realization that sometimes history rolls over you like a boulder rolls over the place you're in and leaves devastation and then moves on in in the novel rye talks about it like a parade that sometimes history marches through your town like a parade some people are in the parade but sometimes you're on the sidewalk and when the parade goes by he resumes the rest of his life and so I wanted it to be, you know, there's no way that as a novelist, I could approach something with the scope and magnitude of War and Peace, but to have it, as I said, be both aspirational for the characters and to be a reflection of what it's like to be caught in the current of history in that one moment um, felt to me like that that was what the book meant to me based on that the second time I read it I en ended up reading it um the first time I can't say I read it because you know I was um as a sort of autodidact trying to catch up on on uh, all of the Same reading here. that I missed I sort of Same like here. I better read the book yeah. everyone says is great I've only exactly. got 1100 pages left to go <laughs> um I think, <laughs> me too. That, I think seeing that play returned it to where fiction should be which is these characters their experience of the Napoleonic War and then to read that great epilogue in which um you know it's just the information you want gave me the courage to write something very out of style in novels now which is an epilogue that kind of brings you up to date and what happened with these characters and the world around them and and so that you know uh, so it, it was a model in both structure in um, theme and for the characters and the aspirational nature, the same way I wanted to read War and Peace to make me a smarter, better, more substantial human being. And it wasn't until I got caught up with the people within that novel because of this incredible play, which back then it was a pop-up theater and it was staged like a Russian tavern with um, sawdust floors and all of the characters, they'd slam a bottle of vodka and some pierogies on your table. And you were in a Russian tavern watching this parts of this play erupt around you. It was stunning. And, I, and it was a snowy night in New York. And I happened to just catch it by myself. Um, it was it, it's one of the most magical nights. And it brought me back to that book in a way that when I read it, I was in that snow. I was in those Russian villages. It was really marvelous. Wow. Gosh. Oh, thank you, Linda. I wish we could have all seen that play together. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, what a magical, what a magical evening, as you said. Oh. Yeah. Um, so we do have uh, one final question. It's kind of a fun question from the audience. Um, and then, but first I would like to just um, read a comment from oh, Barbara. Sure. Um, because it's just a really great one as an idealist who has struggled with the inequalities in life i loved the messages in your book elizabeth's comment about it's not winning the war but winning a battle and rye's comments at the end the world is tearing itself apart and his wife's wise comment always these help me remember that it's the small actions we can do that help transform life from despair and anger to possibilities 
The characters who express kindnesses in the book, Ursula Willard, Fred Moore, Elizabeth, Ms. Ritchie, Dominic, Gemma, and Jules, even Sullivan, who ends his life with forgiveness for the man who killed him, balance the scales of justice even a little. No question, just my appreciation for so much in your book. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that uh, choked me up a little. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then... And then this last audience question, which is a fun one, and it's a little bit of a like, how is this real question? Mm -hmm. yes. um, so as part of the Whatcom Reads um, lead up programs, Colby Libri of the Good Time Girls, um, the Belling History Tour has presented a program titled Vaudeville and Vice in the early 1900s. Um, and she knows a thing or two about corsets. She oh. laces one up regularly as part of the vintage costume she wears during her, her local history tours. And she said, I have no idea how <laughs> Ursula Le Great would be able to quickly remove a corset and get out that cage before the cougar pounces. There's no Velcro, no quick release. So, and, you know, ripping. So what do you think, Jess? Did your corset research reveal that this is indeed possible? I mean, I, I had probably eight months of wearing a corset around um, <laughs> and... Uh, I couldn't find a live cougar, so I would just go to the pit bulls in my neighborhood and see how quickly I could tear it off. Um, I filled it with Alpo because that's all I could really find. Um, uh, and then I found I liked the way it sort of kept everything up. And so I um, uh, no, I, I imagine, you know, I imagine Ursula is half magician. And so uh, I, I, I think she probably did have a sort of, you know, tied like a normal corset but uh, with some with little hooks that actually are holding the thing on the ties are merely decorative probably on the side here I'm imagining there are two little hooks where it just kind of connects so I've, I have some schematics and drawings on my website I really don't um, but if you um, so you can go because there's almost nothing in the novel that is just an act of imagination that I can't support with fact so if you search hard enough on my website you will find um ursula corset schematics that i worked a uh, day and night on yeah Excellent. so but it's <laughs> a right, thank you it's, it's a great we'll question <laughs> and uh, and trust me if that's the only place you had to suspend disbelief then um i'm incredibly flattered because there are a whole lot of things that uh that, that are beyond the explanation of the real and have to and and require some imaginative thinking well thank you I yeah, gotta say, I, I think will, that's I one of the be best answers that. I have ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's it's often when people will tell me, you know, that they've found some mistake. Uh, I resort to the same thing. I remember in um, in beautiful ruins, Pasquale standing on this cliffside. Um, imagining if he builds this tennis court um, and and he thinks of all the yellow tennis balls bobbing in the water as people hit them out and people wrote to me and said uh, in 1963 tennis balls were white uh, and I had two responses I said well Pasquale doesn't know that he doesn't know anything about tennis and then my other response was the thing I always do when I have a mistake which is just go fiction so um, <laughs> in my in my world building tennis balls were were uh were yellow in 1963 and uh, right. Ursula's corset comes off as easy as anything. So, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Nice. I've got well, two last yeah, I was quick say, questions. Paul, oh, sure. Yes. Uh, yeah. One is, and these are like lightning round questions, yes. but if you want to expand on them, that's Happy great. To. Uh, what is your whiskey of choice? Ooh, my whiskey of choice. That's such a good question. I Both like daily uh, and treat. Um, let's see. I, uh, for a Manhattan, I like to use four roses. Um, I, I love a good Irish whiskey. So I drink Jameson is sort of my sit around and sip whiskey. This is a lot more elaborate than you thought. And I love to pull into a town and ask what their best distillery is. Ah, yeah. I've, uh, I uh, enjoyed uh, McMiniman's Hogshead oh, yeah. whiskey, which yeah. is really fantastic. Yeah. That's a, that's, uh, I, I also like that Nika barrel aged uh, Japanese whiskey is incredible. It's a, oh. a little scotchier, um, but the the um, embarrassing thing is that I've yet to meet a whiskey that I didn't sort of like. So. Uh, uh, that I didn't like. I, I tend to I tend to be able to drink just about anything. And and um, when and I often say your well will be fine. So. <laughs> and uh, what is your uh, dream literary basketball team? Wow, my 
You know, my real dream was when Barack Obama chose uh, We Live in Water as one of his favorite books of 2019. Um, every interview about that, I, I tried to coerce him into playing me a game of basketball, um, but he would never do it. Uh, Pat Conroy wrote one of my favorite books about basketball, about playing for the Citadel um, as a young man. And so uh, I, 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 Pat Conroy would be someone I'd love to play basketball with. Um, uh oh uh shoot there john edgar weidman is another terrific basketball player um i used to be on a team called the spokane dirty realists with sherman alexi and another writer named shan ray and we would go challenge mfa programs to games uh, we only did it a couple of times but um we we, we started bringing ringers from gonzaga university people had played there because we so didn't want to lose but uh it was, <laughs> it was great fun being on that literary basketball team Nice, nice. I know, I know you and Sherman like to play. I was wondering if there was yeah. anybody else in that base. Yeah, we, I, I, I think, you know, watching someone in their late 50s play basketball is, you know, I, it's not something you want to do. We, we, I played once in a thing called the Other NBA, which was the National Book Awards, put it, put on a basketball tournament. And people are like, oh, let's go watch writers play basketball. <laughs> and I think at some moment they thought, you know, oh my God, it's like watching mechanics do ballet. You know, it's like, <laughs> there's no correlation between these things at all. Yeah. And I think somewhere around the score of eight to six or something, I started watching people just drift for the, for the exits. So. Well, I'd like to throw, uh, now that Flea has a book under his belt, I'd like to throw him into the oh, mix. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. When he came for a visit at Bellingham High School, he, uh, okay. he sunk it from half court. Wow. Yeah. yeah. He's a, uh, Lee can play, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. He's, he's, uh, he, he brings he, and the he's game. such a basketball fan. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yep, yep. Well, I, I sadly think I'm a better writer than I'm a basketball player. It's taken me years to admit that, but <laughs> I think it might be true. Yeah. That's okay. Well, I remember last night uh, as you were leaving Mount Baker Theater, which you you were fully present these last few days and oh, so thanks. extremely generous. And you said, I have no more stories in me. And <laughs> I, I knew that you did. And thank you so much yeah. for holding a few back and for sharing My those pleasure. with us today. If yeah. anybody wasn't already a fan of yours uh, before this, I know uh, that they are now. You've got some converts oh, and new thanks. discoveries. Yeah. And um, thank you yeah. for your hospitality and for like I said, really those great book events really just fills the heart to go out and have people, you know, have a whole community reading a book of yours. It's a marvelous thing you guys have built there. Thank you. Well, it filled our hearts too. And, you know, reading a book, uh, reading a book is an act of uh, joy and immersion. Mm -hmm. Doing a book club is even more so. And this um, truly mm -hmm. fall in deep in love with your book, hopefully as much as you do. So thank yeah. you for this. Thank Cold you. Millions is such a gift. And so are you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jess. Goodbye, Bellingham. Okay, yeah, and Paul, don't go away. Everybody, don't go away. And thank you so yeah. much, Jess. Um, I just want to remind everybody there is a link in the chat to please fill out an evaluation. Um, the information that you provide there is extremely important to us and to the Whatcom Reads Committee, how they can better improve the programming um, for 2024. And if you were at the Mount Baker Theater last night, you know what the 2024 title is. If you were not, and maybe you don't know, well, I don't have drums for a drum roll, but anyway, 2024, here's the book right here, Red Paint. The Ancestral Autobiography of a Coast Salish Punk by Sasha Takshablu Lapointe. And we are so excited to welcome her for the 2024 um, program. And this is a hyper local book. It is all Bellingham, Skagit Valley. Um, it's, it, this is going to be, we're keeping it real local for, um, for 2024. Um, and it is coming out in paperback next week. I believe so you can get your village books is going to have plenty of copies of paperback um, paperback editions newly sent to us hopefully I think midweek next week. Um, Paul, do you have any final closing words. No, gosh, I'm I'm tapped out like Jess. I think I've said all, the, all I can say. This is uh, this has been such a special week, and thank you to everybody who's attended all of the events. And I'm so glad we can uh, do this uh, to be able to have folks uh, tap in um, from far away. Saw in some of the chats, uh, I think coming from Nevada, and Linda Lambert. I know is kicking herself not to be able to be a part of all of these. She always has insightful questions, and today was no exception. I'm glad you're able to join us, Linda. Okay, and with that, I think we get to say 
that's a wrap. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Claire.